Do you know the difference between elastic and inelastic collisions? Do you understand the conditions under which momentum and kinetic energy are the same before and after a collision? When momentum is not conserved, can you find the impulse experienced by an object? We're gonna talk about all that in today's video. Welcome to AP Daily Live Review for Physics C Mechanics. Okay, so let's get started. What are we gonna talk about today? Momentum, center of mass, impulse, and collisions. My first recommendation for you is to watch the unit four videos in AP Classroom. Those videos um, go over the basic content in center of mass, impulse, conservation momentum. Um, and today we're just gonna do a bunch of practice problems regarding those topics. All right, so the first thing to know is that momentum is a vector. So the direction is important. So if you had an object that was moving toward the right, it would have positive momentum. And if the object was moving toward the left, it would have negative momentum. So we'll need to keep that in mind in some of our examples today. Um, this On the screen, I have Newton's second law, which says that the sum of forces on an object or a system of objects is equal to the rate of change of momentum. But what if the sum of forces on your system is equal to zero? That means the left side of this equation is zero, which means the right side also must be zero, and that means the momentum doesn't change. So the conditions for which momentum is conserved are if you have, if all of the forces acting on your system, if all those forces add up to zero, or a little more realistically, if the external forces acting on your system are negligible compared to the force of contact between the two objects. Think of two cars colliding with one another. There might be some friction between the tires and the road, but that's nothing compared to the contact forces between the cars. There's two different categories of collisions. The first one um, is inelastic. And for inelastic collisions, momentum is conserved and objects can separate post-collision. So let's go back to the example of the two cars. If you have two cars and they collide and then they separate afterward and one of them is dented, that means that some of the energy of the two car system before the collision went into doing work on denting the car. And maybe you heard the crash. So some of the energy turned into sound. So for inelastic collisions, kinetic energy is not the same after the collision, momentum is. Now there's a special subset of inelastic collisions called perfectly inelastic, and that's when the two objects stick together. So it doesn't mean that objects have to stick together in order for the collision to be inelastic. It just means that if you do have a collision where two objects stick together, you know for sure it's inelastic. Okay, and then elastic collisions are where both momentum and kinetic energy are the same before and after the collision. Okay, what if momentum is not conserved? What if there is a non-zero sum of forces acting on your system? Well, the change in momentum of the system is called impulse. And you can find that by integrating the force with respect to time. Now I have Newton's second law here on the screen again. I just rearranged it a little bit. And assuming mass is constant, um, it, that isn't always the case, but it's often the case. Let's say if we have two cars colliding together, the mass of the system didn't change. So you can take that out of the derivative. So the sum of forces is equal to M delta V over delta T. So if the sum of forces acting on a system is zero, then the velocity of the center of mass doesn't change. So the center of mass doesn't accelerate. All right, let's do a vintage free response question. Okay, we've got a block sliding on a frictionless horizontal surface. They gave us the mass of the block and its initial velocity. It's going to encounter a ramp of mass 3m and the block is going to go up the ramp and at the peak of its motion, the block 
will not be moving with respect to the ramp. Okay, so at that one instant in time, the block and the ramp can be treated as one object and they move together with a speed of V1. Okay, and that block increases its height above the surface to H. Okay, the center mass of the block increases in height by an amount H. Then the block slides back down the ramp and it goes onto the horizontal surface and the ramp moves toward the right with a velocity of v final. All right, so that's our situation. Find the velocity v1 of the moving ramp at the instant the block reaches its maximum height. Okay, so what do we know? We know that there is no friction between the block and the horizontal surface and between the block and the ramp. So what that means is the sum of forces is equal to zero. I know that there are external forces acting on the block ramp system because the surface pushes up on the block ramp and then the earth pulls down on the block ramp, but those forces cancel. So the sum of forces is equal to zero. That means linear momentum is conserved. So what had momentum initially? Only the block, right? So the initial momentum of the whole system is just mv naught. Afterward, remember the block goes up and we're, we're looking at the instant the block reaches the maximum height. So when the block reaches the maximum height, that at that instant, the block and the ramp move together as one object. So they both have speed V1. So we've got MV1 plus three MV1. So combine the terms on the right, cancel the mass, and you have V naught equals four V1, but they asked us to find V1, so let's solve for that. It's V naught over four. I hope that makes physical sense. Initially, you had a small block moving at speed V naught, and then it combined with another object and they moved together. So they would move more slowly because the mass of the system has increased, right? So since momentum has to be conserved and the mass increased, the velocity went down, okay. To what maximum height does the center of mass of the block rise above its original height? Okay, so we first you need to define your system. So I'm going to define our system as the block, the ramp, and the earth. Okay, in that case, there are no external, well, okay. The sum, none of the external forces do work on our system. How about that? I know that there's a normal force. I know the surface pushes up on the block, but that normal force does not do any work on the system. So because of that, we can say that energy is conserved. So we're comparing when the block was moving in a speed V naught to the point at which the block is at maximum height, okay. So before, initially, all you have is kinetic energy of the block, right? One half mv naught squared. Afterward, we already said this, but the block and the ramp are moving together almost as if they're one object at speed v1. So they have kinetic energy. That's the first term on the right. And then the potential energy of the block earth system increased because the separation increased by an amount h. So we have that term on the right. Well, we saw for V1 in the last part. So let's substitute in our, our V1, which was V naught over four. So plug that in. Looks like we can cancel M's throughout. And then what can we do? We can cancel the, oh no, we shouldn't cancel that because the last one doesn't have a one half. So why don't we multiply both sides by two? So we get V naught squared equals four times V naught squared over 16 plus two G H, right? And then you would get V naught squared. I'm gonna move the other V naught squared term to the left. So minus V naught squared over four equals two G H. And the common denominator is four. So four minus one is three fourths v naught squared, and we're trying to solve for h, so divide by 2g, 
and you would get 3 8 V naught squared over G. Determine the final speed of the ramp and the final speed V prime of the block after the block returns to the level surface. Is the block moving left or right? Okay, so now our initial is when it was just the block moving to the right, and our final is after the block and the ramp separate. So they're calling the ramp's velocity V final and the block's final velocity V prime. Okay, so we have external forces that are doing that 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 are acting on our system, but they don't do any work, like I was saying before. So we know that linear momentum is conserved because the sum of forces is equal to zero. So we have the initial momentum of the block. We've got on the right the final momentum of the block and the final momentum of the ramp. We know energy is conserved because no work is being done on our system. So we have the initial kinetic energy of the block is equal to the final kinetic energy of the block plus the final kinetic energy of the ramp. Okay, what can we do next? We can cancel the M's and the one halves, right? So we can do V, let me cancel the M's here and solve for V prime. V prime would be V naught minus three V final. And then I can plug that into my energy equation. So we get V naught squared equals V naught minus three V final squared. Oh, minus three V final squared. Okay, so let me foil out this term here on the right. V naught squared minus six V naught V final plus nine V final squared. Okay, so these two will cancel and you'll get 12 V final squared minus six V naught V final. And I think we can take out a six V final. So this is equal to six V final times two V final minus six V naught. Okay, and if you set that equal to zero, I, I left that six in there and I shouldn't have. Okay. If you set that equal to zero, you will get that V final is V naught over two. Now we can take that result and plug it into our equation up here. So this should have been a prime. So let me fix that. V prime. Okay, we're trying to find V prime. So V naught minus three times V final and V final is V naught over two. So the common denominator is two. So two minus three is negative V naught over two. What does that negative mean? Remember momentum is a vector. So the negative means it's gonna be moving to the left. So V prime is negative V naught over two. So the, that hopefully that makes physical sense because what that means is the block, its speed is slower than its initial speed before it encountered the ramp because it gave some of its energy to the ramp. That's what happened. Okay. All right, let's, uh, let's review center of mass. So we have three identical disks. I'll let you read it. You've got an explosion with these three identical disks. Identical means they have the same mass, same shape, everything. But what we care about is that they have the same mass here. Which diagram shows a possible position of the disk at a later time? So this triangle right here represents the center of mass of the system initially. So what do we care about in all these words? Frictionless, horizontal. Frictionless tells you that um, I mean, obviously if you had friction, then we couldn't conserve momentum because the sum of forces isn't zero. If the table wasn't horizontal, then you would have, you know, the earth pulling down on the system and the sum of forces would not equal zero as well. 
So, all right, frictionless and horizontal. Um, okay, so basically we know the sum of forces is zero. That means that the velocity of the center of mass does not change. Well, what does it say? Initially at rest, okay? Initially at rest means the velocity of the center of mass is zero. That means the velocity of center mass has to be zero after this explosion. So in other words, that little triangle that represents the center of mass, the center of mass has to remain in that position. So which of these diagrams shows the center of mass located at the triangle? Well, center of mass is like an average position of mass, right? So the center of mass is gonna be shifted toward the two disks on the left, correct? So it should be the last option. Like this triangle here is equidistant between the two masses on the left and the one mass on the right. And that, that doesn't make sense. Okay. Okay, you've got a person standing on a raft. It's floating motionless. So we probably need to know that. The center of mass is at a distance D from the center of the raft. The person walks to the other end of the raft. Friction is negligible. So we need to know that. How far does the raft move relative to the water? Okay. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna call our origin the center of the raft. So this will be our origin, okay? We'll just label that x equals zero. So what we need to do, we know that a friction is negligible, right? Um, the sum of the external forces equals zero. Okay, we have this raft person system and the water is pushing up on the raft person system and the earth is pulling down, but those forces cancel. And so that means momentum is conserved. If momentum is conserved, that means that the velocity of center of mass has to stay the same. But this system was motionless beforehand. So that means the center of mass has to stay in the same position right along that vertical blue line I drew. Okay, so let's calculate the center of mass of the system before the person started walking. So to get the center of mass, you do sum of each, the mass of each object times the position of the object divided by the mass of the entire system. Okay, so this person is a distance L over two to the right of the origin, okay? And the raft itself, the center of mass of the raft is at the origin. So the term in the numerator from the raft is just zero. And then in the denominator, we have this sum we basically have the total mass of the system, which is just the mass and the mass of the raft and mass of the person. So that's how that's how this expression came about. And they told us that the center of mass is is at a distance d from our origin. So we've got the d there. Okay, now we need to write an expression for the final center of mass. So what's going to happen is this raft is going to move to the left a certain amount. And the person is going to be standing on the left end, okay? So the center, oh, I drew it the wrong, wrong way. If the person goes to the left, the raft has to move to the right, correct? Actually goes this way. Okay, so the person's gonna stand on the left end and then the center of the raft will be somewhere toward the right. And I'm gonna call the distance the raft moves, I'm gonna call this distance X, okay? All right, so the center of mass of the system after the person moved all the way to the left, where is that person? Well, starting from the origin, the person's on the raft and the raft moved a distance X to the right. So first we'll say 
X to the right, but then they also moved all the way to the left end of the raft. So you would say um, X, which is how far the raft moved to the right, minus L over two, because the person is L over two to the left of the center of the raft. So that is this term here. And then the, the person, or sorry, the raft moved a distance X, every point of the raft moved a distance X to the right. So the center of the raft also moved a distance X to the right. So that's this term here. And we're still gonna divide by the total mass of the system, which is the mass of the person plus the mass of the raft. Okay. Let's see if this is gonna get, okay. So, we know that the center of mass cannot change because the sum of forces on the system is zero. So we set the initial cent position of center of mass, that's this one, equal to the final position of center of mass and the denominators will cancel, okay? So I cancel the denominators, that's why you don't see them anymore. And then I distributed the mass of the person into the um, X minus L over two. So that's what this is here. It's a result of the distribution of the mass of the person. Okay. Um, we'll group the terms with an X on the right side. And then these two terms mass the person times L over two, when you bring it to the left, you add them together and you just get mass of the person times L. And then you solve for X, but then what do you notice? Look, all the, look at our first expression. Mass of the person L over two divided by the mass of the system is equal to D. So mass of the person times L is double that, so 2D. So the raft moved a distance 2D toward the right as the person moved toward the left. Two people are initially standing still on frictionless ice. So here's what you need to know, still and frictionless. They push on each other. What's the velocity of center of mass? We don't even care about any of this. We don't need it, why? If it's frictionless, then you know the sum of forces is equal to zero so that the center of mass doesn't change. The velocity of center of mass doesn't change. And since they were initially standing still, that means the center of mass has, the velocity of the center of mass has to be zero after this, it's, it's called an explosion, but um, the two people pushing against each other, okay? So the velocity is just zero. All right, let's try some practice with collisions and momentum. Two students sit at the opposite ends of a boat. It's initially at rest. I'm gonna call this student A and student B. So the student in the front th throws a heavy ball to the student in the back. What is the motion of the boat at the time immediately after the ball is thrown and after the ball is caught? So for the first one, let's call our system the two students in the boat. Okay, well, when student B throws the ball backward, the ball exerts a force on student B but then that student is connected to the boat and the other student, their system. So that means that the student's boat system experiences an impulse toward the right. So that means that the boat is gonna move forward. Now, now that the ball is airborne, student A is gonna catch the ball. When student A catches the ball, the ball exerts a force backward on student A. So that means that the student's boat system will experience an impulse to the left, causing it to stop. 
It's not the only way you could do this question. You could say, well, the ball students and the boat are all one system. And since the ball, um, you know, the students pushing on the ball, those are just internal forces that won't change the momentum of the boat overall. So you know that after the ball is caught, the boat will not be moving, just like it wasn't moving initially. What is the total change in momentum of the object? What does that mean, change in momentum? That is called impulse. An impulse is the integral of force with respect to time. So it's just the area, right? Well, looking at this graph, it appears as if this system experiences a positive impulse between zero and two seconds and an equal negative impulse between two and four seconds. So overall, the impulse is zero, which means the momentum of this system did not change. Okay, we've got two spheres on a frictionless horizontal tabletop. Frictionless horizontal means that the sum of the external forces is equal to zero. So you have one object, initially X is moving at 10 meters per second, and then it collides elastically with another object, which was initially at rest. After the collision, ball X moves the six meters per second at 53 degrees to its initial direction, which re best represents the motion of ball Y after the collision. All right. So another important word here is identical. So the fact that these two objects are identical means that they have the same mass. Okay, so that means that the initial Y momentum has to equal the final Y momentum, right? So you have to conserve momentum in a two dimensional collision. You have to conserve X momentum separately from Y momentum. Okay, so what is the initial Y momentum of this system? Zero, right? Because object X, it's not moving vertically, it's only moving horizontally. So that means that um, M, X, V, sine 53 minus M, Y, V, y oh it's a shame they called it y because now we have vyy it's okay when you do momentum questions the subscripts get a little bit crazy my point is since we know that the masses are equal we can cancel mx and my and now all we're looking for is when is the y component of the velocity of object y equal to the y component of the velocity of object x and that's right here six sine 53, right? So we would need a velocity downward equal to six sine 53. Well, it's not this one. This has no momentum at all. It doesn't even have any X momentum. This one has horizontal momentum, but not vertical. This one is a smaller speed and a smaller angle. So there's no way that's gonna give us something equal to six sine 53. And the last one is a larger speed at the same angle. So that's gonna be a bigger vertical component than we want. So, I mean, there's only one option left. And if it, it, it kind of makes sense, it's a, it's a bigger speed and a smaller angle, so that could work out. Okay. I mean, you can always get your calculator out to confirm, but. Okay, a two kilogram ball collides with the floor at an angle theta and rebounds at the same angle and speed. So what does that mean? Same angle and speed. So what happened to the horizontal momentum of this object? Absolutely nothing. So this floor did not exert a force horizontally on the ball. It only exerted a force vertically because only the vertical momentum changed, okay? 
we have to draw a vector to represent the impulse. And since I know that this floor is pushing up, I'm gonna draw a vector upward and I'm gonna label it J, okay? So what is, what is impulse? It's change in momentum, which is final momentum minus initial momentum. And that's really final momentum plus a negative P initial, right? So our final momentum points up and toward the right, P final. Take your initial momentum, which points down into the left and flip it. If you flip it, now you have negative P initial. Add these two vectors together and the change in momentum points straight up just like, um, just like my vector on the diagram. Okay, we have an object with initial momentum. I'll let you read it. So the initial momentum is this represented by this vector because the other object was initially at rest. So the total momentum is just that arrow you see to the right. Which set of vectors could represent the momenta of the two objects after the collision? Well, this is gonna add up to zero. This is gonna be too long. This will point to the left. This one looks weird. I, I guess we could draw a parallelogram, maybe. It's gonna have a, a vertical component to it. So I don't wanna choose that one. This one looks pretty good. If we just draw, sketch a parallelogram straight to the right. Okay, I like that one. Okay, you have a block of mass 3M which is initially at rest. It's pulled along a frictionless horizontal surface with the force shown as a function of time. What is the speed of the block at two seconds? Okay, well, we know that impulse is the area under a force versus time graph. And we're only interested in the time up to two seconds. So the area of a triangle is one half base times height, right? So this area here would be four, right? Half of four times two. But impulse is change in momentum, right? So the mass times the change in velocity is four Newton seconds. They gave you the mass of the block is three kilograms. So plug that in and you get four thirds, four over three meters per second. That's the change in velocity. But it says that the block is initially at rest. So that means the change in velocity is actually equal to the final velocity. So the, the speed at two seconds is 1.33 meters per second. Objects one and two have the same momentum. So how could we write that? M1 V1 equals M2 V2. Object one can have more kinetic energy than object two if Okay, kinetic energy is one half mv squared. When would one have greater kinetic energy than object two? Okay, let's rewrite this as m1v1 times v1, and this one as m2v2 times v2. Okay, what was the whole premise? They have the same momentum. So that means M1 V1 is equal to M2 V2. And we can cancel the one halves and you get that V1 has to be moving faster than V2 in order for the kinetic energy to be larger. Okay, we have a disc of mass M slides with negligible friction along a flat surface. The disc strikes a wall head on and bounces back in the opposite direction with a kinetic energy one fourth its initial kinetic energy. What's the final velocity? So we know K final is one half K initial. What is K kinetic energy? One half M V initials, sorry, V final squared. So final is equal to one fourth times one half m v initial squared, right? You can cancel the mass and you can cancel the one halves. 
and you get v final squared is one fourth v initial squared. Take the square root of both sides and you get that the final speed is equal to half the initial speed. They told you in the problem that the disc is going to rebound and go the opposite way um, from where it was going initially. So you have to put a negative on it because it's saying, what is the final velocity? It's not asking for speed, it's asking for velocity. So you have to include that negative. The momentum of a moving object as a function of time is kt cubed. Write an expression for the force causing this motion. So we know that the sum of forces on an object is equal to the rate of change of momentum. So we can just differentiate the momentum function. So it'd be 3kt squared. Those ones are kind of fun. It's better than all the algebra we have to do with the other ones. Okay, um, a person holds a portable fire extinguisher that ejects one kilogram of water per second horizontally at speed six meters per second. What horizontal force in Newtons must the person exert on the extinguisher in order to prevent it from accelerating? Okay, so this, you know, I said earlier that usually mass is constant, right? With two cars that collide or two billiard balls or two um, football players, whatever, um, the mass is, this mass of the system is constant, but a rocket, um, the mass isn't constant and a fire extinguisher is the same. So instead of writing um, dpdt is m dvdt, we're gonna do the reverse. Velocity is constant or the speed is constant, but we're gonna multiply that by the rate of change of mass. Okay, so when you when you want to find the force of the water on the extinguisher you multiply the speed six meters per second times the change in mass one kilogram of water per second right so that that, that gives you six newtons that's how hard the water is pushing on the extinguisher that means that the um, person has to exert a force of six newtons in order to keep the extinguisher at rest. In order for the sum of forces on the extinguisher to be zero, if the, um, the if, if one of the forces is six newtons one way, you have to oppose that with a force of six newtons. Okay, we have a balloon a hot air balloon, presumably. And then there's a rope ladder. And you have a person climbing up the rope ladder with speed V. And we know the balloon has a mass capital M. The person begins to climb the ladder. Okay, how does the balloon move? All right, so floating motionless. Okay, so initially, the center of mass was not moving. Center mass system was not moving. The initial momentum is zero. It's, this is all happening in midair, so the sum of forces are zero. That means momentum is conserved. So the initial momentum of the system is zero because you have a motionless balloon. Then you have the person moving up with speed V, so their momentum is mass of the person times V. And then you have the balloon, of mass m, which they gave you, times the velocity of the balloon. So solve for the velocity of the balloon and look what you get, you get a negative. What does that tell you? That tells you the balloon moves down. Hopefully that makes physical sense. If you have a system that needs to remain at rest and part of the system moves up, the other part has to move down. It's kind of like the raft we were talking about earlier. It's just, that this is oriented vertically, that's all. Okay, but we know the mass of the person is less than the mass of the balloon. They told us that in the question. So that means the speed of the balloon is gonna be less than the speed of the person. But the balloon will be moving downward in the opposite direction to the person. Okay, um, a five kilogram object is propelled from rest at time zero. The sum of forces always acts in the same direction. The magnitude of the sum of forces in Newtons is given as a function of T. 
as one, uh, 0.5 T. What is the speed of the object at four seconds? So what do we know? We know that impulse is the integral of force with respect to time. So that is the change in momentum. Because um, we're trying to find this the final speed, right? So we'll have to get the change in momentum. So let's integrate one half T. When you integrate one half T, you get one fourth T squared and you want to evaluate it at the limits from zero to four. So let's see, four squared is 16 divided by four is four minus zero. They gave you the mass, so we can plug that in five kilograms. So change in momentum is mass times change in velocity. So divide by five and you get that the change in velocity is four over five meters per second. But this thing was originally at rest. So that means that the change in velocity is actually equal to the final velocity. So the final velocity is gonna be 0.8 meters per second. Okay, so what are, what, what are the main things you need to know? Momentum is a vector, so you always have to consider the direction that the object is moving. Okay, those little symbols above the P and the V are actually really important. Momentum is conserved when the sum of forces is equal to zero. If momentum is not conserved, then you have a change in momentum, which is called impulse, and it's the integral of force with respect to time. If the sum of forces acting on a system is zero, then the center of mass doesn't accelerate, which means the velocity of the center of mass stays the same. Okay, thanks for watching. Come again tomorrow because Dr. Hood will be here and she's gonna talk about potential energy curves.